just a quick recap. We are in the second vision. The first vision is for the seven churches. And now we're in the throne room. John saw someone on the throne. The description was not given to us. And everything was around the throne. And I want to remind you that the focus was not on the 24 elders or anything that's around it. Uh, the focus is what they were doing. They were all pointing their eyes towards God and worshiping the throne. It is a position of regard. So, so the focus was not on interpretation. Who are the 24 elders, elders and what are these stems and, and stones and all these colors? What does it mean? The, the focus John has given us is what they were doing. So, and then all creation worship. And last week we saw the, the heroic Messiah. But also he looked like a lamp that was slaughtered. Right? God's plan uh, f- to redeem humanity uh, was revealed in heaven last week. Uh, what was a mystery? It's no longer a mystery. And I, I want you to get this idea, right? Last week, uh, we saw the-, the-, the Messiah, which is what the Jewish people expected, a king, and then, uh, but an image of-, of a lamb. So uh, for the first time in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament came together. That Jesus, it's being revealed that he is uh, the, re- the, the redeemer, our redeemer. So we're getting to the juicy stuff of Revelation, where they're getting ready to open the seal. Jesus is the only person that can open it. And in the seal, it behind the scroll is like what heaven looks like, what judgment looked like, and what happened in the past and current and in the future. So it's going to get a little bit uh, juicy. All right, a little bit scary as well. So I want you to brace yourself at home, hold your coffees as you go through this journey with us. And it's worth mentioning before we begin is that we can disagree on the particulars of Revelation, as you will disagree with me. However, we can still be Christians. We can still be brothers and sisters in Christ and worship here at Connected Life Christian Church, even though we might disagree on the particulars of Revelation. So, ready? Let's stand as we read God's word, as we do here every Sunday in reverence. Revelation chapter 6, the seals. The words will be behind me on the screen as well, if you would like to follow along. Revelation chapter 6. I watched as the lamp opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come, come. Or thunder might sound something a little different. Oh, calm, or something like that, right? I looked, and there before me was a white horse in and its rider held a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent to conquest. When the lamp opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other to him was given a large sword then the lamb opened the third seal i heard a third living creature say come i looked and there before me was a black horse its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand then i heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying two pounds of wheat for a day's wages And six pounds of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil or the wine. Then the lamp opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature said, Come. I looked. And there before me was a pale horse, and its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over the fourth of the living of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw the altar and the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and testimony they had maintained. They call out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord? Holy and true until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. When, they, when each of them was given a white robe, they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. 
I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made out of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the skies fell to the earth as figs drops from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded, the scrolls being rolled and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princess, the generals, the rich, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamp, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? The word of the Lord, amen. Whew, you may be seated. If you're visiting with us, that is, there's no jokes in this sermon today. It's pretty, pretty heavy, pretty serious, pretty juicy. So we're going to try to breeze through this, and then we'll have the beach barbecue right after. Uh, what a good way to finish uh, church today, to have a beach barbecue after a sermon like this. So these are the, the six seals. He doesn't open the seventh seal until chapter 8. So the first six seals is open. The first seal was a white horse, right? The white horse represents conquest. That's what the scripture described to us. And the second seal was a, a fiery red one, war. The third one is a black horse, famine. A fourth one was a pale horse, death. This is the progression that we see, an escalation of chaos, and the end result is death. Con conquest and war and famine, the end result is death. Whatever, who, whoever these four horses or who the riders are, their intentions are clear, and there's no second chances. The day has come, the end is near. And there are a lot of interpretation regarding these white horses, or the, we call it the four horsemen. You guys might have read it somewhere. You guys might have read the Left Behind series, series that was introduced to us back in the early 90s. And then several interpretations is, is that the white horse was actually Jesus. Jesus was sent out first to, to, to protect everybody before the, the, the judgment comes. Uh, and then the fiery red one, the black horse, and, and the pale horse are, are God's judgment, sending out after Jesus. Jesus to judge the world. Another interpretation is that all four horses are good. That's God's judgment. And the, by this point, everyone that are Christians has been raptured already, that we're going to escape the tribulations. And another interpretation is that all four horses are bad. They're all God's judgment. Everyone's going to be subjected to these four horses and they're going to judge the world. And then another interpretation is that uh, uh, the white horse is actually Satan himself. Uh, it just being uh, disguised in white clothing, like Jesus says, wolves in sheep clothing, and he's pretending to be Jesus, and he went out first, and, and instead of helping or saving, he ended up judging and tricking the world. And like I said, you know, we can disagree on the particulars of Revelation, and we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ and worship. But what I do want you to know is Revelation is apocalyptic language. Just a reminder, it's revealing. Revelation gives us a scene, behind-the-scene view of what happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen. That's the whole purpose of Revelation. What happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen. And my suggestion for you, and I want you to tune in, and most theologians would agree to this. And it's biblical. It's not something made up or, oh, I think this, that we're just going to take this straight out of the Bible. Most theologians would agree to this, is that the four horsemen represents the purpose of Revelation, what happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen as we wait for the return of Jesus. The four horsemen represent, once again, what happened because of the fall, what is happening as the time we're living in now, and what is going to happen when Jesus returns. Each one of these horses has its own unique description. Conquest, war, famine, and death. Since the fall, 
creation has always been subjected to chaos. People rule over people. This is not a new thing. This is not a black and white thing. My own country in Vietnam was subject to the French rule for hundreds and hundreds of years. Have you guys heard of banh mi? Vietnamese sandwich banh mi? Yeah, yeah. That's French influence, by the way. Yeah, we have one Californian visiting with us. She's like, yeah, we know banh mi. There's a huge Vietnamese community in California. All right, we know banh mi is, is French influence, by the way. That's where my Vietnamese people got banh mi from because we were under the French. So pe- human beings has always been subject to, to chaos. People enslave people. People go out to war. A famine uh, always had happened throughout history. You can Google that now and see the, throughout history, the, the disease, and, and we couldn't figure out why it was happening. The four seals, the first four seals, reveal to us the result of human rebellion, life without God. We see it before us. We see it in front of us, and our children will see it if Jesus doesn't return by then. Everyone was, is, and will subject to this fallen world, Christians and non-Christians. And Paul pointed out this view to us back in Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. If you have Bible, go ahead and turn it there real quick. For I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing to the glory that would be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Listen to this. For the creation was subjected to frustration or futility, another interpretation, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. I, I, I can envision and imagine this, right? Like right when Eve, which we can never have a clear picture of it, but right when Eve bite into the apple, the four horsemen was released from heaven. This is chaos. This is sin. This is what it's going to look like until the return of Jesus. And Paul has to put this in picture for the people that he was preaching to. That since creation of the world, we've been subjected to this kind of chaos. There's nothing new. We think that we are experiencing persecution or bearing our cross when someone disagrees with us on, on social media or or we're boycotting a certain store, or, or our friend's stopping talking to us because we have a certain view of the scripture. We, we think that's facing persecution. The guy who wrote Romans chapter 8, verse 19, and most of the New Testament, he was beheaded for the cause of Christ. What we just read I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That line, what we just read, the guy that wrote it was beheaded for what he wrote. That's persecution. We think we're going to go through persecution. Christian has always been persecuted. Disease always happened. War always existed since the fall of humanity. We've been living in chaos in the Bible and outside the Bible. Human has always been hostile to each other, regardless of race or economic levels. God communicated to us through history, through the scripture, through nature, through all the creation, through his prophets and through miracles. And he says, I am your God. Nothing else is working now, isn't it? Not your kings, not your queens, not possession, not anything in life that you can earn or take whether by, by force or just simply inherit. And nothing worked out. He says, I am your God. And if you have been influenced by Hollywood or unbiblical literature, 
Or non-Christians, people who just want to take a stab at it and say, this is the end of the world, this is what it's going to look like. Or those who hasn't read the Bible, or haven't read the Old Testament. And we've been getting these images from TVs or books that we read in our head, what Revelation would look like. It can be scary. But if that's all the images we have in our head, we're really missing out on how comforting the book of Revelation is. The promise from God, his promises to us. Remember last week, the, uh, the scroll, and, and John wanted to see a little bit more, and he wept because no one can open it. And, and this Jesus, the only person that can grab the scroll, and said, I'm going to open it. So therefore, Jesus is our salvation. For all believers, the scroll contains, I want you to hear this and take this home and take this to the bank. The scroll contains inheritance from God to us. Not judgment. Not these scary images that you have been ingrained in by Hollywood or some TV show or some books you read that's not in the scripture. Listen to this, verse 9 and following. Let's bring that up real quick. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the sounds of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge all blood? Then each of them was given a white robe. You, you're picking up what I'm putting down here. You're reading carefully what Revelation, Revelation is it's revealing to us in, in this uh, fifth and sixth seal. It says, look, they were calling out to God. They were all given a white robe. They were under the altar. And next, then each of them get given white robe, and they were told, wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So there's this time where God knows the timing. We don't know the timing. I watched. He opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like a sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the king of the earth, the princess. So, so those who are in charge, those who think they got life figured out, those who say, I have everything, you should listen to me. Or the princesses, uh, those who are manipulating, the, the, the generals, those who think they can rule over you, uh, the rich, those who think they, they have it all, they don't need God, the mighty, those who think they're too strong for God, uh, who walks around thinking they don't need God, they can go through life by themselves and everyone else, both slave and free, the poor and those who are subjected to other people, hid in caves. That pretty much covers everybody. And among the rocks, the mountains, they call to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? And if you just read this part, it can be scary. Earthquakes. The star is going to fall onto the earth. Heaven's going to be rolled back. The souls of those who have been taken to sleep. There was a great chaos. And if you, that's all you read and that's all you've been listening to Hollywood or the books you read or some YouTuber. Yes, it can be scary. And we completely miss out on the two parts. They call out in a loud voice. They were given a white robe. And the one that were cry, crying out for help were those who were not in Christ. And I present to you, believers, when that time comes, and it's going to come. We don't know when that time is going to come. So stop trying to guess it. But know this. When that time comes, believers worship. The world worries. Because we are sealed by the king and comforted by the lamp. Amen? God's people are under the altar. Having a conversation with God. God, how long? When are you going to do this? And God says, wait, wait a little longer. And they were given a white robe. Who was scared? The people who didn't know God. 
who were thinking they got life figured out and in charge of everybody else. It says, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slaves and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And the question was, who can withstand this? It's a good question. Who can withstand this type of judgment? I put this on Facebook yesterday and said, hey, we want you guys to read this before church tomorrow. And someone read it and they said, no mercy? <laughs> I said, well, tune in. So I hope you're tuning in. All right? If you are watching, I'm glad you tune in. If you're not, it's okay. All right? Who can withstand this? This is a good question. All of us in this room, are we going to go through this? Is this going to happen to us? Are we going to experience this type of tribulations? Well, the answer is in chapter 7. Because the, eight, the seventh seal hasn't been opened yet. He just opened the first sixth seal. The answer to your question is in chapter 7. So turn your Bible into Revelation. Back to Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back four winds of the earth to prevent any, any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angel who has been giving power to harm the land and the sea. And this is what the end. So imagine with me here. As judgment comes, there are winds coming, and then the four angels were sent, will held back the four corners of the earth. Remember, this is imagery. This is, this is apocalyptic language, language that we don't simply use anymore. It's revealing something behind the curtain for us, right? So, so four angels were holding back the four winds, and then the angel came with the seal. Remember the seal that no one can open it except Jesus Christ? He came with the seal. This is the future. This is what's going to happen. Came with the seal. He said, Do not harm the land or the sea or the tree until we put seal on the forehead of the servant of God. You should be encouraged by that verse. Before the judgment comes, the seals that was opened by Jesus Christ, the the angels delivered it and said, don't harm. We're going to put a seal on the believers, on the servants of God. And it went on to give a description to the 12 tribes. There's 12,000 here, 12,000 Reuben, 2,000, 12,000 the tribe of Gaz, the tribe of Asher. These are the, the 12 tribe of, of Israel. So throughout history, people interpret this and say, well, there's only going to be 144,000 people will be saved. Our Jehovah Witnesses, friends, would knock on your door and convince you of this, right? Oh, there's only 144,000 will be saved, so you need to be the one of them. So today is the day for you to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, or you're going to miss out. You're going to be the 145 or 144,000 plus one, something like that, right? But they've been saying this forever. So the number has grown a little bit, so their number has changed, right? Well, now we're up to like 148,000 or something like that. So stop. Stop it. It doesn't give us a clear picture of how many will be saved. But I'm going to tell you who will be saved. It's in verse 9. After this, I looked. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, from every tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamp and all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. They all fell down on their faces before the throne and worship God saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to be to our God forever and forever. Amen. You should encourage by reading this. Then one of the elders asked me, so this is kind of like a, these, these I call it the, the funny moments in the scripture, right? There's a little bit of sarcasm here. So I'm sure John was a little bit scared or, or kind of like in awe, kind of like some of us reading Revelation. It's like, wow, what's going on here? So I, I, I picture John is going through the same thing and there's a little bit of sarcasm to break the mood by an angel. So the angel asks, asks John, he says, uh, these white robes, who are they? 
Where did they come from? So remember right, after the, right before this, John wept. As John being revealed this picture in heaven, and he was weeping, and maybe the angel was breaking the tension a little bit, and said, John, who, who are these? What are, you, what are you afraid of? Why are you crying? Are you still scared? Who are these people in these white robes? The angel was asking John, you know who these people are? You still wonder you're saved or not? You still wonder if you're, you're going to go through the tribulations or not? And John says, sir, you know who these people are. And these are the most comforting words to you and I in the scripture. He says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne, he will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again they will thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. This is an Old Testament language, by the way. Remember the people in Egypt, they were, they were slaves, and they're building pyramids. And, and the Bible described the scene as, as they were, the sun was beating down on them. So this is the language of of freeing, freeing them from slavery, this, this liberating from God, this liberation from sin. And he said, never again will they hunger, never again will they will thirst. The sun will not beat down on them or any scorching heat, for the lamp at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to spring of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What if we read the scripture for what it's worth? Take out the Left Behind series, take out Hollywood, take out all these movies, and you read the scripture what it's worth, you realize how comforting end time is for who? For the believers. For the believers, we worship while the world worries because we are sealed and protected by the king and comforted by the lamp. Someone asked me, and, and this probably part of your conversation on a daily basis, right? But people ask you, are you pre-millennial or post-millennial? This is where we get that, by the way. The rapture, and are we going to go through the tribulations? Are we going to escape it? Or what's going to happen? Are you pre-millennial or post-millennial? Right? Pre-millennial basically is like uh, the rapture in Thessalonians. And it says God's people is going to be lifted up, and he's going to judge the world. So, so are we going to be one day you're just sitting there having dinner with your family and Jesus comes back and you're just going to be lifted up and then the four horses going to come he's going to judge the world? Or the four horses are going to come one day and he's going to judge the world while you're still sitting there having dinner with your family? And then Hollywood had put out, I didn't want, you can Google this, I didn't want to put a picture up there because I don't, I don't want to put that image in your head either, right? Or that there's these souls just like, Flowing up into heaven. It'd be really awkward even in the middle of taking a shower and then like the rapture happened. You know, like, that'd be awkward, right? I know, that's what I think about. <laughs> pre millennial post it's gonna be awkward. Like, hey, you. <laughs> there are all kinds of views regarding the rapture, right? Are we going to be in it? Are we going to be out of it? Is God going to protect us? Is there going to be a, a thousand years of, of judgment? But are we going to be a part of that thousand year, thousand year judgment? Or are we not going to be a part of that thousand year judgment? Yes, I feel the same way when I read it. Right? Like, me and you are on the same page. It's like, yeah, I, I scream. Right? In my office, I'm like, what are you talking about? Are we going to go through this or not? Are you post or are you pre millennial? I'm going to tell you what I am. And I want you to be this as well. I'm pan millennium. All right, because post or premillennium, it's not in the Bible. The scripture never talks about pre or post millennium. It's not in the scripture. What is in the scripture is that I'm pan millennium, and I hope you're pan millennium as well. And you're like, what? What's pan millennium? All right, pan millennium is, is things are going to pan out the way God intended to be. <laughs> So, so you can read a thousand books or watch a thousand YouTube videos you want. And we can disagree on the particular, right? We're still Christians. We still worship God. But God, the things are going to pan out the way God intended to be. My first youth ministry interview 
the pastor asked me, are you a pan-millennial, are you, are you post-millennial or pre-millennial? To be honest with you, when I graduated from Bible college, I have no idea what pre- or post-millennial is. So I just sat there and I just stared at him. What are you talking about? I didn't get the job, but that's, that's besides the point. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm glad I didn't get the job because that landed me here. <laughs> so it, it didn't work out. The, 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 things are going to pan out the way God intended to be. The appropriate preparations for end time. And some of you guys might have heard this. Built yourself a bunker, right? Underground. And go and buy a bunch of spam and put it in there because you need it for seven years because there is a view that the world is going to be judged for seven years. So you got to build a bunker and put enough food in there that will last you and your family for seven years. And there are people doing this. Spam is a terrible food choice anyways, if, you, if that, you're one of those people, all right? Uh, spam is a terrible food choice. But the appropriate preparations for, for the end times is not the bunker or, or, or how much food you're going to put in to store for you and your family. As science has it, if a moon or a star is going to crash into the earth the way Revelation describes it, as science has it, your bunker and your spam is not going to stand a chance, right? Now, have you seen, like, if an asteroid hits the Earth as the size of New York, we'll be annihilated. Imagine if it's a star actually hits the Earth. There's no bunker or spam. There's no, there's no how many office, Home Depot runs you're going to make. It's going to save you from this. This is the most appropriate way to prepare for end times. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior? Being baptized in the water as the Scripture instructed us to do. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, according to the Scripture. Because from what I read, for the Scripture, for what it is worth, it's pretty plain and simple. And he said, in chapter 7, beginning verse 14, These are they who have come out of the tribulations. I, I, I'm imagining we'll see John. I imagine we'll see Paul. We'll see Peter. We'll see Jonah. we see Isaiah. we see Jeremiah. we see Elijah. We see all these Old Testament prophets. we see King David. You think they didn't go through persecution? We think that we're the only people that's going through persecution. I think we'll see them. We, we, we see them in their stories. Oh, remember Jezebel? Oh, remember I was swallowed by a whale and, and I was spending a couple days in there? Oh, remember when I was sitting on the mountain of Egypt and I looked at my people being carried off into Babylon from Jeremiah? Oh, I, I can imagine Isaiah is telling us the story. There was one time I encountered God and God says, who is going to go and preach the gospel? Who's going to share the good news? And Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips. I imagine we encounter Moses as he tells us the story. Yeah, all those people in, in, in the desert, man, they were annoying. I wanted to wipe them out, but God stopped me. Yeah. I imagine Moses would tell that story. Oh, they're, they're, the water wasn't good enough for them. Or the manna. They wanted more. They wanted steak, medium. Some of you guys like medium rare, but that's weird. So, you know, they wanted more than what, I was, like what God was giving. And so I imagine we hear these stories of these people. This is what it says. They came out of the tribulations. And I see you, I see our congregation, our church, whether we agree, disagree, we fought here and there, we, we didn't like the color of this, or we didn't like the one sermon or two or whatever, but we see each other because we're protected by a shepherd, we're comforted by a shepherd, and we're protected by a king. It says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. They are before the throne of God. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne would shelter, will shelter them with his presence. Here's the most comforting thing. Never again they will hunger. If we take this into the middle of Haiti, of Vietnam, 
talking to children and parents and say, you will never hunger. You take this in the middle of the desert and you say, you never thirst again. You take this to Tanzania where water source is so contaminated that they can't have appropriate water to heal themselves. You never thirst again. You take this in the middle of uh, at some of the places in Amazon and said the sun would not beat down on you or any scorching heat because Jesus, the lamp at the center of the throne, will be your shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The first vision of Revelation was to comfort the church, the victorious church. I don't know if you remember that or not. At the end of the, every letter to these churches, he says, to the victorious, to you, things going to work out because you are in Jesus Christ. Believers will worship. The world will worry because we are sealed by the King and comforted by the Lamb. Amen.